हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार बेहिसाब लुटा दे प्यार बेहिसाब लुटा दे प्यार हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार बेहिसाब लुटा दे प्यार बेहिसाब लुटा दे प्यार हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार प्रेम का सौदा न कर दिल से दिल दरिया तू बन प्रेम का सौदा न कर दिल से दिल दरिया तू बन दिव्य प्रेम के प्रकाश को दिव्य प्रेम के प्रकाश को दिव्य प्रेम के प्रकाश को बना अस्तित्व का आधार बना अस्तित्व का आधार हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार बेहिसाब लुटा दे प्यार बेहिसाब लुटा दे प्यार हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार हृदय मेरे तू बन उदार हृदय मेरे तू बन Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The eleven blessings of the Mother and Shri Aurobindo to all of you from Shri Aurobindo Ashram, Delhi branch. This uh, devotional song that you heard just now was about generosity, udarta. And uh, one important thing that uh, it talked about was uh, giving without any calculations. Love does not calculate, and uh, on this, uh, there's a short story. Uh, once uh, a lady went to a shop and uh, told the shopkeeper, give me nuts for this much amount. And the shopkeeper just picked up a fistful of nuts and gave it to her. Another customer was uh, watching all this. And when this lady was gone, he told the shopkeeper, uh, you didn't even uh, weigh the nuts and uh, seemed that you gave her much more than uh, the amount that she paid. So the shopkeeper said, I love this woman. And in love, there's no calculation. So this person who was there, he was a very spiritually inclined person, this other customer. So he suddenly thought that uh, I love the Lord. But then even in that, there is a calculation. I keep a count of how many times I have chanted his name or how many times I have... Uh, moved the beads in the rosary. I keep a count 27 times, 108 times, and so on and so forth. So he thought that there's a lesson for me to learn from this shopkeeper, I should not calculate. So that is what generosity is about. Now we go on to the today's session, which is the last one. And uh, our focus will be again on yoga. And uh, we'll be starting with uh, exploding some common myths about yoga. Much of what we talk, you already know, but then there are ways and ways of uh, repeating the same thing, making it interesting as well as uh, a sort of a recapitulation. Glory to the Master and the Divine Mother. The YES program is a part of the 150th birth anniversary celebrations of uh, Sri Aurobindo and the 75th anniversary of India's independence. What is yoga? Yoga is a process of self-improvement. 
Now, there is no dearth of self-improvement courses going around, which have nothing to do with yoga. And uh, what is the aim? The aim is that if the person, the student learns to concentrate better, he'll do better in exams. And they may use some techniques which uh, have some resemblance to the yogic techniques like the meditative techniques. Or the aim may be to improve the productivity at the workplace by achieving better harmony amongst the people who work there. And again, there may be a, some similarity to the yogic processes or uh, the uh, type of things that we talk about in yoga, thinking uh, like uh, positive thinking and uh, looking at each other with a great deal of compassion and love and so on and so forth. But then uh, if the student does well in the exams and the productivity improves, the self-improvement course is considered successful. But yoga does not stop there. In yoga, self-improvement is an endless process or at least seemingly endless because after some improvement has been made, there is scope for still further improvement. And therefore, the logical conclusion is that uh, this process will stop or at least reach some important destination when uh, the improvement has reached a point where there's hardly any scope left for further improvement. And that is we call, what we call the point of perfection. Now, perfection is something that we commonly associate only with the divine. Man, by very definition, is imperfect. Which means that when the person reaches the point of perfection, he has reached a point where he has achieved some sort of an identity with the divine, a union with the divine. So that is what the word yoga means, union with the divine. And what therefore it means is that uh, it's a process of self-improvement going on up to self-perfection. And uh, that would be considered synonymous with union with the divine. And uh, in practice, what it means is that uh, the uh, deficiencies, the handicaps, the drawbacks, the limitations that the person had as uh, an ordinary person when he started, they have been all overcome. And uh, he now has uh, a knowledge which is vast and deep. And uh, he now can organize his life in terms of this higher and deeper knowledge. And uh, he also has discovered that the source of that deeper knowledge is within me, in my soul, which has a dynamic component, the psychic being. And uh, if uh, by superficial instruments, the body and the mind work in light of that uh, guiding source within, uh, which is uh, my ultimate uh, uh, source of uh, the highest truth, then I'll be able to not only organize my life in the best possible way, do what is right, but I'll also get a great deal of joy and peace and I'll be growing spiritually, which is the very purpose of life. So the person realizes this and uh, this certainly does not happen only by the person realizing that uh, this type of a, an inner light exists within himself, but that the same light also is there in all creation, in all the people around him, and the result is that now he has a more harmonious relationship with people around him because now he does not view them uh, uh, the way he did earlier, me versus all the rest. But he finds that there is, an, in fact, not only a similarity, but an identity between him and the rest of the creation. The identity which he has established with the divine is not only with the unmanifest divine, but also in the manifestations of the divine, which all the people around him and the rest of the creation are. So with that, he develops a sense of intimacy and love with people around him. And uh, that naturally also makes the relations harmonious, something you know, which uh, also happens in the other self-improvement courses to some extent and improves the productivity at the workplace. So in yoga, we carry this process of self-improvement to its logical conclusion and link it to the one that is perfect, the one who has no limitations, the one that knows all and can do everything. So that way, the process of yoga goes beyond uh, the ordinary courses on self-improvement, which may have a limited aim. And uh, also it uh, has a, an aim and goal, which is much higher than these other courses, like doing better in exams or improving the productivity at the workplace. Its uh, goal is much higher. And uh, the fact that even in the process of yoga, these things do happen, the student starts doing better in the exams, the productivity at the workplace improves. These are side effects or fringe benefits of the process of yoga.
Now coming to the myths. Myth number one, yoga is a set of asanas. Now this is uh, something so common that uh, we don't even qualify it in any way. We don't say that asanas are the physical practices of yoga. When we say yoga, most people think that we are talking about the asanas and maybe at the most pranayamas and meditation. But asanas are only a part of the yoga and a small part of the yoga, although the most significant visible part of yoga. Not only that, asanas do not automatically become yoga or become a part of yoga. For that, the asanas have to be done with a certain attitude. And uh, what is that attitude? The attitude is that uh, I'm doing these practices so that my instrument, that is the body-mind complex, becomes fit for the work for which I have come to this world, the work that uh, is fit to be offered to the divine, the work that will that is my opportunity for spiritual growth, for addressing the very purpose of life. Another way to have that attitude is that uh, this temple, the body-mind complex, which is a sort of a temple, should be worthy of the inhabitant, that is the soul. So the divine, the deity, the soul within should be surrounded, should be placed in a temple that is worthy of it, and therefore, I should keep this body-mind complex in a good shape. So the attitude is like that of uh, a person who is taking care of, say, the machinery in a factory. That uh, I have been uh, made in charge of these instruments, and therefore, I should uh, take care of them, service them, oil them uh, at the proper time in the right way, so that this machinery continues to do its job for long and uh, in the same way we have been given this body mind complex by the divine and uh, the least we can do is to take good care of this machine this instrument that we have been given so that it can continue working for a long time continue doing the work for which we have been appointed for which we have been given charge of this instrument we have been trusted with uh, taking care of the instrument and doing something with it so what we should use this instrument keep the instrument in good shape and use it for the purpose for which uh, we have been provided it and we have been interested that we'll use it for that purpose, which is in our own interest in a way because uh, that is what uh, makes our life also as a side effect, healthier and happier. Now with this attitude, even walking, swimming or cycling can become yoga. But without this attitude in asanas, just remain asanas. They don't become yoga asanas. Now, myth number two, yoga relieves stress through meditation. Now, this is a, again, a very common feeling because people come with not only the problem, they also come with the prescription. They say, I'm under a lot of stress, please teach me meditation. It's sort of taken as axiomatic that what is wrong with it. Everybody knows meditation relieves stress and it may be a part of yoga, but I basically want to learn just meditation. But... Uh, the fact is that uh, without a change in attitude to events and circumstances of life, meditation alone, can alone cannot do much to relieve stress. Expecting that just sitting quietly for 20 minutes, no matter what elaborate technique we use along with it, expecting that that will relieve all our stress and these 20 minutes will compensate for all the tension and turmoil of 24 hours is asking for too much from too little. And uh, the key is, that uh, we should be able to look at all attitude, all events and circumstances of life in a different light. And uh, what is that light? That these events and circumstances have come to me as a gift from the divine. They have come to me because they were necessary for uh, uh, me to fulfill the purpose of my life, which is spiritual growth. So these are all triggers for going towards giving a direction to my life in such a way that I move towards union with the divine, I grow spiritually, my consciousness becomes higher, deeper and wider. These are all different ways of putting it, but in effect, what it translates into in our behavior is become a better person. So they have come to me for that purpose. And it is common knowledge that all types of crises, traumatic events, difficulties and problems in life, which overwhelm us, become the trigger for becoming 
or can become a trigger for becoming a better person. Most people who turn to the spiritual path have done so under in such moments, in moments of a crisis. And therefore, it can happen. Of course, I mean, it's not that it will always happen. I said, you know, stress is like boiling water. And uh, the response to boiling water is different for different things. If you put carrots in it, they become soft. If you put eggs, they become hard. And if you put sugar in boiling water, it dissolves. Now, people who break down uh, under stress, they are like carrots. Uh, all their energy is gone and uh, they may go into a depression and uh, they feel all is lost. So that is breaking down under stress. Then, you know, there are people who uh, somehow negotiate the problem, but after that, they become totally callous and insensitive. Uh, I don't care for anybody. I don't care for anything who helped me when I was in trouble. And uh, therefore, now I will not bother about anybody. I'll not bother about anything. They become callous and insensitive. They get hardened by difficult by difficulties of life, that is like an egg becoming harder. And uh, then there are people who respond like sugar. Uh, they merge more and more with the people around them because uh, some of the people around them do uh, help them and they realize our interdependence. They become more helpful to others. They become better people. In other words, the division between the person and the rest becomes uh, more and more blurred. And uh, this is what the process of yoga is about. The blurring of the boundaries between me and the rest. So the ego boundary starts collapsing and uh, the person moves towards that merger with the rest of the creation, which indirectly also means merger with the divine, becoming one with the divine. So this, these events become a trigger for becoming a better person. So in that person, in that process, the person's old identity, which was defined by his ego, by the boundaries of his skin, that collapses. And uh, that's something like the sugar dissolving in the water. And because their behavior undergoes a change, their life becomes sweeter and their surroundings also become sweeter. So that is like you know, sugar dissolving and making the water sweeten, sweeter. So the water becomes sweet, the surroundings become sweet. So these are the three different ways. So at least the opportunity is there. And uh, same applies also to events which are pleasant, which we call good fortune. That applies to those also. If those are accepted with a sense of gratitude and uh, uh, good fortune means that now we have excess of something more than we need, what we have in excess we share with others, then that also uh, uh, makes us uh, feel one with the others because now we are not looking at just in terms of my needs versus uh, somebody else's needs. We are just looking at which need is more important. And if for that it is, uh, uh, we find that what I have can be shared with somebody else and that person needs it more than I do, then that uh, is also dissolving that ego barrier. So with this type of a change, unless there's a, this type of a change, unless there's a change in this direction towards the, attitude, towards the events and circumstances of life, the person cannot get rid of stress. And... Uh, Meditation can facilitate that process. Meditation can be that period when the person can go into a reflection and see how far the person has been able to work on himself and change himself uh, as a result of the triggers that he is getting uh, almost on a daily basis in life and some major events become major triggers. So how good the person, how well the person is using these opportunities is something which one can examine and then uh, being human, we would have failed sometimes, we would have some weaknesses. So the person works on those weaknesses so that uh, the uh, person resolves that next time I'll do better. The person may find that these difficulties are too overwhelming for him. He may offer them to the divine for processing and uh, thereby feel that to his own feeble efforts has been added the power of the one who has no limitations and therefore the person feels more empowered as well as more confident in processing uh, those weaknesses. So these are all different things which can happen during meditation. But meditation by itself will not help much because what people generally want is to make minor changes in their everyday routine as little as possible. And just by adding one little technique, they expect that every problem will be solved. That actually does not happen. In fact, to relieve stress, meditation is neither necessary nor sufficient. 
which means that if the person is able to change this attitude without meditating regularly, then also the person can relieve stress. In fact, the entire uh, day or several times of the day while working, etc., can become meditative. The person can do them with a meditative poise. And therefore, a formal meditation, sitting down quietly at a fixed time of the day for 20 minutes may not be necessary. So meditation is not really absolutely essential. It's not necessary for relieving stress, nor is it sufficient. Which means that uh, if nothing else is done, then meditation by itself will not really relieve stress. And that is what explains why it fails so often. And then people don't still uh, blame it on uh, what else they should be doing apart from meditating every day, they think that they do not know how to meditate. So in that sense, nobody knows how to meditate. So the important thing is not the exact technique of meditation. The important thing is to realize that meditation is a helpful technique, a very useful technique. But at the same time, this technique by itself will not help us relieve stress. Moreover, in yoga, meditation was not really designed for stress management. That is again a fringe benefit of uh, meditation. Meditation was designed so that we can quieten the surface activity of the mind. The mind by nature is very chaotic in its uh, behavior. The emotional part of the being is very volatile and therefore uh, subject to big swings, up and downs, ups and downs. And uh, the intellectual part, the uh, intellect, that part of the mind, thinking part of the mind is again, uh, can be extremely inventive and busy and keep sort of running here and there in different directions. We get thousands of thoughts every minute. And uh, uh, therefore, that is again a very restless part of the mind, the thinking part of the mind. So both the parts of the mind being so restless by nature, uh, one cannot really look deeper within. For example, you can't look at the bottom of a swimming pool when the surface is turbulent. The surface needs to be quietened. And uh, that is what the press process of meditation is about, different ways different devices that have been used, different disciplines that have been used for reducing the ordinary surface activity of the mind, reducing the chaos and the congestion of the mind so that one can look deeper within and discover that inner light, which uh, is our true essence, our divine essence, our everlasting reality, which in turn is also capable of influencing the way we live. And uh, to discover that and to resolve that, that that starts influencing our everyday activity more and more is what meditation has been used for. And uh, of course, it is during these meditative states that people have been able to, some select few have been able to go sufficiently deep within to not only discover that, but also see in it uh, their everlasting reality, see the same in everybody around them. And from that also uh, realize or at least extrapolate uh, the very creation of this material universe, how it started with the one that now is there everywhere, how that one became the many and created this universe. And then on that, they've speculated why uh, that divine the one, the infinite, the absolute reality had to also limit itself in this way and manifest in the form of this material universe, manifest in this form, which is not only multiple has plurality, but also a vast degree of diversity and differentiation. Why it had to do it, they have speculated on it. So all that has come after they experienced something completely out of the ordinary during a meditative state. Because uh, to be able to see that is not something which is uh, in keeping with our ordinary experience based on senses or to that sensory experience, even if we add our past experience and memories and so on, all that does not give us this wider, deeper and higher view of the world. This spiritual worldview can be arrived at only when we transcend that type of ordinary instrumentation of the mind. But of course, the mind is the gateway to that sort of uh, a uh, access to that higher level of consciousness. That is, uh, in human beings, mind is that has that capability of transcending the mind itself. But then all that can happen more easily during the meditative state. And that is why meditative techniques were not only designed, in fact, one can say they were stumbled upon. Because when a, a person who is so obsessed with this question, how did it all begin? Uh, 
why did it happen why was the universe created what is uh, the purpose of my life how am i related to the rest of the creation in other words what is the relationship between the creator and uh, the creation including me as an individual it's called the relationship between the jiva jagat and jagdish jiva the individual jagat the universe and jagadish the creator of the universe so what is the relationship between these three when a person is very obsessed with this type of questions then the person finds that uh, many other things which appear interesting and absorbing to us start disappearing from his life his life starts getting simpler and uh, he goes into uh, moods of deep and intense concentration and uh, then he finds that there are some ways by which this concentration can be made more effective and when he discovers those he has in turn stumbled upon a meditative technique and then some of them have also tried to describe what helped them uh, go into that state of intense concentration and then we get yet one more meditative technique so that is how meditative techniques have been stumbled upon by those who are uh, were totally absorbed consumed with passion for answering deep existential questions and uh, when they concentrated on those questions they stumbled upon the meditative techniques as we call them now but in fact for them it was just something which happened uh, because when you are in that state then when you're also able to sort of uh, discover those methods which make that concentration more effective so that was the purpose for which uh, the meditative techniques uh, or rather that is how meditative techniques evolved uh, as the rest of the yoga evolved and uh, therefore they were not really designed for stress management the fact that such a person was not under stress was because now the person had a wider and deeper uh, view of things the person's concerns and uh, obsessions and uh, uh, desires uh, had more or less disappeared because now the person was uh, totally consumed by a higher goal which had replaced all the other uh, ordinary goals of life and his relationship with others had undergone a tremendous change because he was not looking upon them as others but as a part of himself that boundary had disappeared these are the things that help this person be in a state of peace rather than the ordinary duality of joy and sorrow so joy and sorrow are the two sort of sides of that peaceful state which one can reach when uh, the reasons for that joy and sorrow disappear and the reasons disappear when our knowledge expands when our awareness expands when our consciousness expands and one of the things that can ex- help in expanding the consciousness in that direction is intense concentration and s- intense degrees extreme degrees of self purification now the self purification comes because now the person's concerns are very limited and therefore now the person's life automatically gets much simpler his desires are and needs are very little and uh, therefore now this person uh, has a relatively simple life uh, with very few needs and uh, that is uh, uh, what uh, helps besides the meditative technique so basically i mean these are the two methods which uh, all the rishis mystics in various study and mystics in various traditions have used intense concentration and extreme degrees of self purification the two facilitating each other so meditation is not in fact something which uh, has been designed for stress management in yoga meditation is something which uh, has evolved which uh, the mystics and rishis have stumbled upon in the process of intense concentration so i'm not saying that therefore it should not be used for stress management but uh, what i am trying to say is that to expect that the technique by itself will be able to relieve all our stress is expecting too much from too little we have to be prepared for a bigger change in our life a change which may look difficult but a change which is the only way to become healthier and happier in a world which is uh, basically erratic and unpredictable now myth number 3 yoga needs renunciation of life now when we think of the spiritual aspects of yoga it's a common tendency to think that well yoga is of that type for us it is asanas and pranayamas but yoga of that type which is spiritual is meant only for a select few 
who go away to the Himalayas or to a cave and go and search for something like God. So it is for them. We people are so caught up in our everyday responsibilities and obligations that we have no time for that type of renunciation, running away from the world. And therefore, that yoga is not meant for us. But in fact, uh, uh, yoga is something that can be brought into everything, into work and play, eating and sleeping, and everything that we do. So as we saw in the case of the asanas, everything else can also be done in uh, the same way with a yogic attitude. Work can become worship when done with that attitude, the attitude which we have in karma yoga as an instrument of the divine and uh, uh, with no attachment to the outcome of the work. And that applies not only to work but play because the boundary between work and play itself disappears because one starts enjoying the work and uh, eating and sleeping. We have talked a lot about eating in this course and seen how, the way we eat, how it can make eating also a part of the spiritual practice. And the same applies to sleeping as in the case of eating. Eating is necessary to live and be healthy. Sleeping is also necessary to live and be healthy. That is how we are constituted. So we sleep with the attitude that uh, uh, I'm sleeping because my body is so constituted. It needs this periodic rest. And we pray that uh, this rest should rejuvenate me. It should recharge my battery so that when I get up tomorrow morning, I'm ready to do what I'm here in the world for fulfill the mission of my life by giving what I have to those who need it. That is what essentially all work comes to when it is uh, becomes a part of karma yoga. It is more about giving rather than getting. Not that one cannot make a living out of it, but then that is incidental. That is, uh, uh, by the way, the main thing is through this work, what is it that I'm giving to the world and to those who need what I have been equipped to give equipped in terms of this body-mind complex, equipped in terms of my circumstances, which gave me all the education and training and background and experience by which, through which I'm able to give something to a certain set of people. So, we, uh, so that is what the sleeping should enable us to do yet one more day and we sleep with that attitude and then get up and remind ourselves again, thanking the divine for yet one more day available, yet another day beginning during which we can which we can use in that way in the right way for doing what we have come here for so yoga can be brought into everything that we do all our interactions and all our actions now with that attitude uh, you can clearly see that uh, outer renunciation that is uh, uh, running away from ordinary worldly life or even uh, giving up certain type of foods or uh, uh, sort of to prove that we have been able to actually renounce and overcome our attachment to uh, everything uh, which to others appears very interesting and reasonable for that purpose to torture ourselves. None of these things is really necessary. What has happened is what actually instead should be happening is uh, that when we start living life with that attitude, there's an inner renunciation, which means that uh, now the person is not attached. The person is not dependent upon things like food and other sensory pleasures for his happiness. If they are there, the person can enjoy them. When they are not there, he does not miss them. So that is an inner renunciation. The person is not thinking about them all the time. The person is not thinking, what will I get at the next meal? Will it be tasty? And if this meal is tasty, then uh, when will I get it again? Uh, if right now life is going well, how long will it last? He's not bothered about all these uh, questions because now, he has better and higher things to think about. In fact, that is the only way to achieve the type of detachment or renunciation, which uh, can be called inner renunciation, which means that the goals, lower goals have been replaced by higher goals. If there's nothing to look forward to, if there's nothing higher to look forward to, then one cannot really overcome the attachment to what one is already attached to. It's only when that is replaced by something higher, something better, that one can automatically overcome that attachment. Then those things start falling out of life. They don't become our consuming uh, thoughts and emotions. They remain there, maybe hidden in a corner, but all the same, that is not our primary concern anymore. We have better things to think of, better things to work for. So that is what gives that inner renunciation. 
And with this type of inner renunciation, outer renunciation is not absolutely necessary. And therefore, it may be variable. Uh, people giving up the ordinary pleasures of life to different extents. It's not that they'll all be living with the in extreme poverty with the bare minimum. But because that is not necessary. Because for so far as attachment is concerned, a rich person can be attached to his riches, but at the same time, a hermit who has given up everything on the outside, if there has been no inner change, this hermit can be equally attached to his begging bowl. So it's not uh, that, so it is overcoming the attachment which is important, not how much the person has given up in visible terms. And therefore, it is this inner renunciation which has come by uh, replacing lower goals by, with higher goals that is important. And once this inner renunciation proceeds, then the attachment to outer things starts falling. It's a process, it's not a one time event. And uh, as that happens, many of the things on the outside which the person was earlier using or relishing, they start falling out of his life, which means that outer renunciation also starts happening. But it is not uh, using uh, brute force to force oneself to give up something which the person is attached to, real, feeling that that is itself spiritual in itself. The person has achieved this inner renunciation and uh, after that, the outer renunciation is not necessary, but it automatically follows. So, sort of to sum it up, uh, without the inner renunciation, outer renunciation is not of much use. On the other hand, with inner renunciation, outer renunciation automatically follows. And uh, that is what Sri Aurobindo meant when he sent, said, all life is yoga. Now, this is something which can be easily misinterpreted. It does not mean all life, no matter how lived, is yoga. What it means is all life is suitable as an opportunity for the practice of yoga. All life is field for the practice of yoga. Everything that we do, all the interactions that we have, all the ups and downs of life that we experience, all these are opportunities for the practice of yoga, for moving towards higher, deeper and uh, wider knowledge, which in turn will uh, take us towards merging with the divine. Merging with not only the unmanifest invisible divine, but merging also with the creation around us, which includes all the people around us. So developing that relationship of universal love with everyone around us. So that is the direction in which all life can lead us, everything in life that we do or experience. Myth number four, yoga is a system of medicine. Now, system of medicine is primarily concerned with the preservation, promotion, and restoration of health. That is not what yoga, is, or yoga was designed for. For that matter, yoga evolved. Yoga, like the meditative techniques, all everything in yoga has in fact evolved uh, because uh, different uh, rishis and mystics who uh, concentrated on these uh, deeper existential questions have decided to uh, stumbled upon different techniques some more on the physical techniques, some more on the mental disciplines, and some of them decided to focus while uh, leaving behind a record for posterity on physical practices, some focused more on the mental discipline, uh, but uh, uh, they basically have tried to crystallize for posterity the ways and techniques and methods that helped them on the way, on the path of the discovery of that deepest truth. So, that is how yoga seems to have evolved. But uh, health was never the primary goal of yoga. Health, like uh, peace of mind, is a byproduct, a fringe benefit of yoga. And uh, because of various things, because uh, the person uh, starts uh, thinking that, well, I should keep this instrument in good shape. The person is not, if the person is not attached to sensory pleasures, then the food person will select food which is good for health rather than which is more palatable. So the person becomes physically more active because he realizes that also helps. And most important, the person is more and more at peace within. The person's mind loses its restless character and the person becomes more and more peaceful. And uh, since there is a very intimate mind-body connection, this peace of mind itself makes the person also physically more healthy. So 
health is a byproduct or a fringe benefit of yoga and because for a yogic life or a spiritual life also the body mind complex should be in good shape health is certainly a desirable for the practice of yoga doesn't mean that uh, illness cannot become an opportunity illness can also become an opportunity for the practice of yoga everything in life can become but certainly it would be much better if health becomes that opportunity rather than ill health and to some extent health will automatically follow as a person lives a yogic life but that does not make the person immune to illness even the greatest of yogis had illnesses severe illnesses incurable illnesses and they did not become immortal so health is desirable for the practice of yoga but when illness comes that also becomes an opportunity for the practice of yoga and uh, in fact some very ordinary people have used incurable illness like cancer in that way because cancer is a type of disease which people think essentially is incurable and to some extent it is true and uh, therefore the person knows that i now have a few years notice and some people by nature have that type of opening when this type of an incurable illness serves the purpose of an advance notice of a few years and the person uh, instead of getting obsessed with the illness or himself now the person starts becoming more loving and caring and uh, in the process the person forgets himself forgets his illness and starts expanding his awareness people have used it that way not only the result has been that they have used the remainder of their life for spiritual growth or for practicing yoga that invisible part of yoga not only they have used the remainder of their life for that purpose these are the people whose remainder has also become longer and in some cases they have even overcome the cancer completely so illness can also be an opportunity but certainly health is a better opportunity and that will be an opportunity that will be available to most of us much longer than an illness because we are basically geared for health not for disease the body is designed in such a way that most of us will be most of the time in good health and to preserve that good health so that we are healthy even more than we would otherwise be and when we fall ill we recover as quickly and completely as possible is desirable and yoga helps us in doing that that is yoga in a comprehensive looked at in a comprehensive way so yoga would help us stay healthy and good health would help us practice yoga so yoga is desirable health is desirable for the practice of yoga uh but certainly health in yoga is not an end in itself it is the means to a higher end having a healthy body mind complex becomes the means to walking towards the divine towards taking more steps more meaningful steps without uh, uh, unnecessary obstacles and interruptions by doing the type of work for which we are in the, here in the world for uh, which is in fact helping us fulfill the purpose of our life so in yoga health is a by product it's not an end in itself but the means to a higher end however yoga is often used as therapy and when it is used so commonly it is restricted to the physical practices like asanas and pranayamas sometimes meditation is added to it it is restricted to techniques the practice is half hearted because the person is doing it primarily because of fear of death and disease and uh, without necessarily the attitude that should go with it and the techniques are toned out of context they are not been done with a spiritual context but primarily as a treatment and many people like it because they find that on the whole it is better to spend an hour or hour and a half a day on these techniques instead of swallowing pills they take the two as interchangeable which is not true it's not an either or approach uh but we'll not go into the details so it's not that uh, if i'm doing yoga so i need not i can stop my medicines that is a great misunderstanding that should not happen or i want to do yoga because i'm tired of drugs i don't like taking drugs and so on and so forth now these are erroneous attitudes not an either or uh process the drugs are have also been given to us by the divine those who discovered the drugs also got them because the divine willed it so if we look at it that way then we will not have that either or approach and will not sort of uh, feel that well doing this little bit and leaving the rest of my life totally unaffected will make me healthy but the way it generally happens in 
uh, yoga therapy is that uh, by and large it is restricted to the techniques the practice of the technique is half hearted and torn out of the spiritual context the fact that uh, all this done in this restricted manner so little done so half heartedly still gives very good results and that is why the reputation is there still it gives gives very good results one can imagine how much greater would be the benefit if it was done properly myth number 5 yoga is an add on that takes about 1 hour per day people often ask how long time how much time does your yoga take which means the less time it takes probably the better the yoga is because i am a very busy person but uh, it's not an add on by adding which to our daily routine we will be able to ensure health and happiness that 1 hour per day misunderstanding applies only to the techniques such as asanas pranayamas and meditations and as we have seen any of these techniques whether it is asanas and pranayamas or whether it is meditation done without the yogic attitude do not really become a part of yoga meditation can be just called a concentration technique rather than a spiritual technique and uh, the asanas and pranayamas would be like any other physical exercise if done without that attitude and on the other hand yogic attitude may be brought into life without practicing the techniques it may be brought into the not only our work and play eating and sleeping and so on it can also be brought into jogging cycling and swimming so this all so while the techniques are a part time activity without any obligatory influence on the rest of the life which means we can just use it as an add on and leave the rest of the life totally unaffected and feel that we are practicing yoga but actually it will not only not influence the rest of the life the benefit that we get in terms of health and well being will also be limited on the other hand yoga is not a part time activity it is a full time activity it is a lifelong commitment it's not that we you do it till I, my back pain goes and after the back pain is gone now i need not do it it's a lifelong commitment uh it commitment that influences the motive that is the inspiration the purpose and the quality of everything that the person does myth number 6 yoga is an easy way to good health yoga is neither easy nor designed for good health as you've seen yoga is not about getting up early to do the asanas and giving up fried foods it's not about uh, doing a few things and uh, then expecting that uh, some miracle would happen trying to give as little as possible and get as much as possible yoga is not a way, way of giving up a little like say getting up early in the morning instead of sleeping so that one can do the asanas or uh, eating uh, green vegetables instead of fried foods so giving up a little bit to gain a lot yoga is a way of giving up a lot and giving it up voluntarily because one finds it enjoyable expecting nothing and getting everything getting everything because that is what fulfillment is about and that is what comes at the end of yoga because the person has become one with everything the one who has everything and is everything what else that what can that person need so therefore that person has a sense of fulfillment fulfillment goes beyond contentment contentment means i am happy with what i have i know i don't have many things but i don't need them whereas fulfillment means that i don't need anything because i have everything we end with this very uh, deep quotation from sri aurobindo in the right view both of life and of yoga all life is either consciously or subconsciously a yoga even if we restrict it to this life although this quotation can be expanded a lot and cover the entire course of evolution of the universe but restricting it to human life and this life even if we do that then one can say that uh, uh, everybody in human life is practicing yoga either consciously or subconsciously subconsciously because uh, uh, when a person has evolved to an extent that the person has now got a human life human birth on this earth the person still you know has a lot more of the animal consciousness in him and therefore he basically still remains like an animal a feeding and breeding creature a little more of a thinking creature 
but all the same, basically a feeding and breeding creature. But then uh, somehow or the other willy nilly at the end of life, the person may reach a point where he ends up being more conscious of the deeper truths of existence than he was when he arrived in this world. So he has done a bit of yoga. He has become a little better person. He has started realizing more and more that there is something beyond the obvious. The world is not all that I see. There is something definitely beyond it. There is a higher power and that is in many ways influencing not only my life, but everything that is happening around me. The person becomes a little more conscious of it. But all this change from ignorance to a little less ignorance, from dense ignorance to a little less of ignorance, has happened subconsciously. The person was not making any conscious efforts for it. So through the way he lived and the way he, what he did during life, for various reasons, he has ended up a few steps ahead of where he arrived at. It has been many steps forwards, many steps backwards in life in terms of consciousness, but he has ended a few steps ahead. Now, if this continues life after life for several lives, then ultimately the person would arrive at a stage of evolution where this person since childhood will be aware of something beyond the obvious, will feel the aspiration to know that deeper truth much more intimately and therefore the person will somehow discover and outer circumstances will be organized in such a way that the person will discover uh, a path which will help him move closer to the goal that is merger with the divine through a type of life that he's living consciously. So he's consciously living the type of life that will accelerate that journey towards the ultimate destination. And for this, the outer circumstances seem to organize themselves in uh, different ways. And there are infinite are the ways in which this may get organized. There will be a mixture of could be extremes of good fortune, there could be extremes of misfortune or a mixture of both. And uh, at some point that awakening will come and uh, the person will give an entirely new direction to his life. He'll discover a path and he'll discover a guru. So then the person is in that life living, practicing yoga consciously. But even in the previous many earlier lives, he was practicing it subconsciously. So in the right view, both of life end of yoga, all life is either consciously or subconsciously a yoga. This is the place from where I'm speaking and where I live and work, Sri Ashram Delhi branch. And uh, as I said yesterday, some of you may, might not have been there yesterday. Uh, these courses are completely free and today's the last day, so that's why I'm saying it again. Uh, these courses are completely free, but they do cost something. And uh, Therefore, voluntary donations would be welcome. Even small donations are welcome. And if you would like to donate something, you may send us an email and we'll provide you the details of the bank account to which you can transfer any amount that you are happy to do. The email address is yes at yesspirituality.com and you can send an email with any questions or comments, not necessarily because you want to donate. A gratitude to the mother and Sri Aurobindo for making the sessions and the prog program possible. And thank you all for being there. Anyone wants if to ask there's question. any questions, you can unmute and ask or anything you would like to share. Just want to say thanks so much, so much. I'll personally be coming over and taking your blessings and also be spending time with you, Dr. Thank you. 
So while you're thinking of questions, what uh, uh, I'll do now is to share screen again and uh, tell you a small story. The story is a tale of two girls. Now, here is uh, the mother of one of these girls, Gauri. Uh, Gauri is in the bathroom and he's telling her, hurry up Gauri, I've been telling you for the last half an hour that you are getting late. You're taking so long in the bathroom these days that you hardly have time for breakfast. I'm sure one of these days you'll miss the bus and then you'll realize why I shout so much. Yelled Gauri's mother. Gauri terminated her bath promptly, got ready at an amazing speed, tied her shoelaces, picked up her bag and said, bye mom, I'm going and I'll get ready faster tomorrow. And the usual early morning hassle, which uh, most parents have experienced with school going children. So Gauri finished everything quickly, was ready in time for the school bus and just picked up her bag and said, I'm leaving. I'll get ready faster tomorrow. But then you can imagine what her mother would say. What? Are you going without breakfast? You can't do that. Just a minute, said mummy, swiftly picked up a sandwich and literally pushed it into Gauri's mouth. I'm not hungry today, said Gauri, in a voice muffled by a mouthful of the sandwich and tried to extricate herself from this hand to mouth combat. All right, just have a glass of milk and then you may go, said mummy. With a silent but clear expression of reluctant reconciliation, Gauri gulped down the glass of milk just as she was beginning to feel that the ordeal was over, the ordeal you know, of being stuffed with a sandwich, for being forced to take milk and so on. Just when she was beginning to feel that the ordeal was over, mummy said, you can have the remaining sandwich as you walk to the bus stop. So the ordeal was not yet over. She had to carry the remaining sandwich to the bus stop. Gauri picked up the sandwich and just as she turned towards the door, mummy started off again but in a much kinder voice. Cross the road carefully, dear. Don't ma doesn't matter if you miss the bus, but take no risk on the road. You should save time while getting ready, not while going to the bus stop. Okay, have a good time. You too. Bye, said Gauri, as she almost ran out, clutching the sandwich in her hand, the heavy bag slung on her shoulders. Bye, love you, said mummy looked at the receding figure of her daughter for a while, and then bolted the door. Soon after leaving home, Gauri saw a poor girl about her own age. She had a gunny bag slung on her shoulder and Gauri observed that she was picking up all sorts of useless things from the road and depositing them in the bag. Gauri still had her sandwich in her hand and she didn't exactly relish the idea of munching it on the road. For her, this poor girl was a godsend. Gauri said to herself, here is a girl who is obviously hungry. I am neither hungry nor do I like eating on the road. The next step was obvious. She gave her sandwich to the girl who accepted it readily and with grateful eyes. From now onwards, Gauri started observing this girl rather frequently on her way to the bus stop. She also seemed, that is this other girl, also seemed to have a routine like herself. She reached Gauri's neighborhood at about the same time every day. Gauri felt a strong urge to give her something to eat. She invariably deliberately started bringing a part of her breakfast in her hand and hoped earnestly that she would meet this girl with the gunny bag. Quite often, her hope materialized. So she started enjoying the process of uh, giving this sandwich to this girl. And so she would, in fact, try to design it in such a way that she has she can carry something while coming out of home and going to the bus stop. This went on for some time and inevitably did not remain confined to a sandwich or paratha changing hands. Gauri discovered the girl's name, Lilavati. Gauri and Lilavati also started sharing their good and bad moments off and on. Gauri felt a lot better when she shared with Lilavati her anxiety and fear one day as she was dragging herself to school, ill-prepared for the maths exam. She also told Lilavati when she got a prize at school for athletics. On the other hand, Lilavati started sharing her jubilation with Gauri when one of Gauri's neighbors moved 
that is, they shifted to another house, they had left behind a lot of junk, which Leelawati collected by making an additional trip with her mother. At five rupees a kilo, they expected to make a tidy sum from the junk. Leelawati had her bad days too, like the one on which she got a cut in her hand while picking up some rags which concealed pieces of broken glass. The short morning meetings between Gauri and Leelawati went on for a few years. Then suddenly one day, Leelawati told Gauri that she wouldn't be coming for these morning rounds anymore because she was about to get married. And soon she stopped coming. Gauri missed her off and on. A year later, Gauri finished school and joined college. Her routine changed and she more or less forgot Leelawati. Gauri finished college and got married. Gauri got a lovely daughter whom she named Neha. Neha started going to school and like her mother, barely made it in time for the school bus. One day when Neha was specially late, Gauri had to send her with a sandwich to be eaten on the way to the bus stop. After saying goodbye to her daughter, Gauri lingered on at the door, watching the receding figure of her daughter. As she was about to bolt the door, she saw Neha offering her sandwich to a rag picker. A tear rolled down her cheek as she bolted the door. The joy of giving is much greater than the happiness of getting. Thank you all. Yes, if somebody wants to say something, they can unmute and speak. You may share about how you found the course, sort of feedback on the course, if there are no questions. There are a lot of, uh, thank you messages in the chat box, but uh, no question as such. So thank you so much for sharing the, the yogic wisdom. It's something uh, 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 which we can all try to imbibe. I know it is, uh, it is extremely difficult, but I mean, we are uh, on the right uh, path. And thank you so much for showing us this yogic path, uh, which is unparalleled. I mean, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thank you, team, for wonderful delivery. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank so you for much. giving all of us an opportunity to fulfill the purpose of our lives. We are speechless, actually. We are speechless. We are only only one word that is the the thank you, thank you, and thank you. While the rest of you are thinking of uh, what you might like to say, uh, there'll be a long gap between uh, the end of this course and the beginning of Yes.03. Yes.03, we are planning to begin on the 15th of September, and that will be a rather long one. It will go on till the 15th of December, and that will be on health sciences. We'll study the structure and function of the human body and keep relating it to both health and disease and to yoga. And along with that, of course, there'll be practical classes on yoga, which will take you yet one step further in the process of becoming yoga teachers. So that will be yes.03. But during this uh, long gap between now and the 15th of September, we'll continue with weekly events. And uh, uh, some of you might have uh, attended some of the yes talks, which have been so far on Fridays at five in the evening. Assuming that this time may be a little less suitable uh, we are thinking of changing these events to Saturdays, 6 p.m. and also diversifying their variety. Instead of all of them being one and a half hour talking sessions, some of these will be yes dialogues, that is two or three people discussing something. And secondly, 
uh, some of these will be very short sessions of just about half an hour, maybe 20 minutes of speaking, followed by 10 minutes of uh, uh, questions and answers. These we'll call yes capsules. So all these yes talks, yes dialogues, in yes capsules, uh, we'll now try to have as far as possible on Saturday evenings at 6 p.m. And you'll keep getting the information about these as you have been getting so far. And the joining link will remain the same as for this course. So this will continue uh, till we start with yes.03 and even after we start yes.03. So this will be a continuing activity of the yes program. Hello, I have a request uh, for the next course, when you organize the practical sessions on asanas, pranayams, can you do it in the morning at about six o'clock? Because at 8.30, we cannot, you know, we can only watch, we cannot do the asanas simultaneously. Yes, I understand. I mean, uh, 8.30 is not the time for many people to do the asanas. But then we have our difficulties in being able to get the teacher at that time. The only way would be that we record the session in advance, a pre-recorded session, which we play at six in the morning. Now that again, I've realized we did that to some extent in yes.01, we had pre-recorded videos for the practical sessions, but that was extremely cumbersome. Much easier to have a live session and to get the teacher live at six in the morning so frequently is difficult. But uh, what uh, I can suggest is that uh, the practical part, then you can see in the class recordings. Okay. Thank you. Uh, namaste, sir. Can I go ahead? First of all, I would like to thank you for uh, this module. We learned a lot uh, from all the whatever you taught us. It was a treasure trove for all of us. Thank you to you and the entire team. I had a, a small difficulty, especially in this nutrition module. We learned a lot. And uh, some of the things that we were following, uh, all these years we have been following a certain pattern and whatever knowledge we gained, it was a little um, uh, overwhelming for me. And I really, I don't know where to start. So I'm not able to figure out what to leave and how to start because uh, see for example the salads what the other day uh, uh, Dr. Katoj mentioned that we should not take the cooked and raw food together and we have been eating salads uh, all, all, all our lives along with the cooked food so it kind of leaving that and starting a new thing all, all these information is a bit overwhelming for me so I just uh, I would request you to just uh, give a small guidance on that thank you You might have seen that throughout the effort has been to tell what is ideal and yet to also uh, provide some compromise which is reasonable because of our previous habits or because of the compulsions of modern life. So as Dr. Katoj said that yes, while it is best to avoid eating cooked and uncooked food at the same meal, you can take salads uh, in a moderate amount with the meal, but then that can be at the beginning of the meal and uh, finish all the salad and then start having cooked food. Instead of uh, say having a bit of cooked food, then one bit of carrot, then uh, a little more cooked food, then a piece of cucumber, you know, don't eat it that way. Finish all the salad first and then go to the cooked meal. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you again for your guidance. Excuse me, sir. I have one more question. Uh, instead of you know following do's and don'ts, like you like it is said, eat salad separately and all those things. There are so many do's and don'ts. 
and combinations, uh, virudhabhas and other kind of things. Uh, how do we develop our body sense to realize, to find out on its own, rather than you know, learning do's and don'ts? That's a very good question. But uh, unfortunately, the human species has lost to a great degree that type of inability. In animals, it's very strong because no, they don't have to learn anything. And yet, by and large, they are able to avoid uh, plants which may harm them. Plant-eating animals, they know which plant to eat and which plant not to eat. So they have that innate sense. Uh, and also, maybe their sense of smell, et cetera, is so well developed that uh, they don't touch a plant which is likely to be harmful for them. Maybe it's also the instinct is passed on uh, through in some mysterious way from generation to generation so that the child at birth knows what it is to eat and what is not to eat. Uh, but in human beings, those abilities seem to have been lost because of our better mental development. Um, and uh, therefore, for human beings to reply, uh, depend entirely on uh, our innate sense may be difficult. And that is why we need to learn uh, all this uh, from others, from books, and of course, from our own experience. But to some extent, after having consumed, yes, uh, sometimes we can get that feeling from within that this doesn't seem to suit me very well. And one can then learn how to correct it, if necessary, by again seeking advice from someone who knows that this is what is happening to me when I'm eating this food. So one can seek guidance for that. Like the story which you recited about Gauri, uh, she doesn't feel hungry in the morning. Probably better choice had been not, not to give food to her or give food to her in the morning. That's again a good question. Uh, breakfast should be light. That, of course, uh, is... Uh, Ayurvedic wisdom. And also if the sandwich had something salty in it, uh, to have that with milk is again not the right thing. It's a uh, uh, But having said that, a light breakfast is not something which is uh, not permitted in Ayurveda. And children uh, and old people, for them, some of the injunctions about how many meals a day and so on don't apply. Thirdly, uh, we have to sort of, again, couple it with uh, a little understanding of uh, the compulsions of uh, daily life. Now, the student may be uh, in school or maybe back from school uh, quite late, maybe 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the afternoon, uh, when uh, much of that pitta kal from 10 to 2 is already over. So this child has the choice of only eating something early in the morning, something in the school break, and then having a late lunch maybe at 3 in the afternoon. So... To say that, therefore, her, her lunch is the heavy meal which she should depend upon and that can be her only meal or one out of the two meals that she has in a day may not be the best thing to do. So uh, the more important principle than uh, how many times a day one should eat is that one should eat only when one is hungry. So if she had an early dinner, probably at breakfast, she will be hungry and she can satisfy it with a light breakfast in which there's no virudahar. And uh, then, you know, in school, again, if she has taken a light breakfast, children at that age will be hungry by about 11 when she may have a break and she can eat something. She can carry something, again, a healthy food from home rather than depend upon potato chips and a, a cold drink in school. And uh, then when she comes back, 2.33, she can have a heavy lunch and then a very light dinner. So it becomes four meals, but then she's eating basically when she's really hungry. And that is a more important thing to do. And if one goes by some of the modern science studies, there are plenty of studies which show that children who do take breakfast, because there are children who miss breakfast routinely all over the world, that children who take breakfast regularly have a better academic performance than those who miss breakfast. Those studies are also there. Uh, namaste, sir. Uh, uh, looking at the advice you have given right now, mm -hmm. I feel that sometimes uh, the same thing happens uh, with the people who are doing into the, who are into the physical activity, because mm -hmm. I am dealing with the people uh, who who are from a fitness school, uh, and in that case, uh, say uh, having only two or three times food may not be suitable. They have to take food. Uh, 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 as soon as they are hungry, 
uh, and this is what happens with the uh, people who are into the exercise field and also the people who are athletes they have to take sometimes the food six or seven times and sometimes they uh, they have to take heavy food uh, even at say 4 pm so in that case uh, i think uh, as you rightly say these are the compulsions of the uh, their uh, their lifestyle and their uh, uh, physical needs or the uh, the needs of the sports uh, i would be happy to uh, uh, have your views on this and sometimes they have to take non vegetarian food as well and uh, and that becomes a, a necessity for them so how do we uh, uh, how do we balance So again, these are good questions which can bring out a little more useful uh, comments for everybody. Uh, they should eat or anybody should eat not as soon as hungry, but when hungry, which means that one can eat uh, an hour after being hungry. So okay. one, one hour one can stay hungry. Why I'm saying so is that uh, firstly, it should not become an emergency. I'm hungry. My stomach is, uh, is making those sounds which make me feel that I'm hungry. So I must have something immediately. Firstly, it should, it's not an emergency. Secondly, let's understand why it is necessary to eat when it's hungry and not otherwise. That is when one is full, That why one should not eat at that time. Because if all our meals come at a time when we are still not hungry, then we are not giving the body to, a chance to use those mechanisms which come into play at the time when the previous meal has been completely absorbed and the body is making a shift from carbohydrate metabolism to fat metabolism, shifting its uh, fuel from predominantly carbohydrate to a substantial amount of fat when the body is making that type of a shift. Now that is a mechanism, a useful mechanism in the body. If we eat every time before we are hungry, we are not giving that mechanism a chance to work. And if we don't use any mechanism, it gets weaker. If we use it, it becomes stronger. So if we use it and using it would mean that we make allow one hour to elapse after we are hungry. We have used for one hour that mechanism and then we are eating. So we are giving a chance to that mechanism to work for one hour routinely and maybe even longer when we are observing say, a periodic fast. So that mechanism is being used longer. So that you regular and frequent use during fasting of this mechanism will make that mechanism stronger. So it's good to make this useful mechanism in the body stronger by giving it an opportunity to work. That's why we should eat when we are hungry, not when we are full. Secondly, you said that uh, this person who is in a fitness school and gets time to have a heavy meal only at 4 p.m. Now, again, we have to realize that firstly, the compulsions. Secondly, 4 p.m. is also not very late in the evening. Second, thirdly, this is generally a young person and a young person's digestive fire will be quite strong even at 4 p.m. Therefore, it doesn't matter. So main thing is the digestive fire. Typically, it's the strongest from 10 to 2. But by 4 p.m. in a young person, it's still sufficiently strong to be able to digest a heavy meal. So it will be okay. And third, you said about non-vegetarian food. Now, again, non-vegetarian food, uh, if the person feels it is uh, necessary for some reasons, the person can take. But at the same time, this is a common misconception that a person who is an athlete or a sports person or is doing very heavy uh, manual work, this person needs non-vegetarian food. That is not really true. One can have a balanced diet, even from a vegetarian diet. If he needs more calories, he can have those additional calories through a little extra fat and uh, nuts. And uh, uh, so far as I mean, the various supply of different nutrients goes, uh, getting them in sufficient quantity and quality from uh, a vegetarian food is as much possible for an athlete as it is possible for others. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right, I think uh, with that, we come to not just today's session, but also end of the module. And uh, once again, thank you everyone for your time and space. As usual, we end with the music and we look forward to see you in the next module. Thank you, everyone.